Hi, Charlie. Hi, good afternoon for you. <laughs> good afternoon, yes. We're pretty close. It's morning still, right? Yes. That was a, that was a puzzle. Um, in, in Zoom, when I looked at the meeting, it was scheduled for uh, uh, 12 noon London time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know why you were seeing that message. Because so, uh, Spain is a weird case. We are, so London time, I think it's uh, UTC, just UTC. And, okay, uh, hey, Sergio. Sorry, um, it looks like we've got someone else attending already. Um, so okay. I, um, I'm going to promote you first to um, panelists, and then we'll have to let, um, yeah. Um, uh, so I've. Did I lose you, Sergio? Yes, hello. Uh, uh, is it Nasser? Hello. Uh, yes, this is Nasser. Hi. Uh, uh, so uh, the uh, webinar is going to begin in an hour. Okay, in one hour later, right? Yeah, I'm not sure if we've got a time zone change issue. Um, uh -huh. but you're welcome to stay on, but we're, we're not going to start for another hour. Oh, it's totally fine. Okay. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Oh, it's fine. It's totally fine. I'm looking forward to hear from Sergio and you and okay. Then I'll try it again for one hour later. Wonderful. Thank you for, uh, thank you for attending on a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, you, for organizing such a nice uh, program. Uh, well, uh, no, I'm. It's it's my pleasure. Okay, we'll talk to you in an hour. Okay, then in an hour. Cheers. Bye. Charlie. Yeah. So yeah, it looks like um, so UTC is now is noon UTC time. No, you, now it's noon UTC plus one, I guess. Yeah. And I probably, did I make a mistake in that you're an hour ahead? Yeah, so now it's noon for me and... Um, Ouch, okay. And uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, that's totally fine because uh, there was one person, so... Um, and that this person is being informed, so maybe what we can do is just keep this open, and as people show up, we can tell them to wait a bit more. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm sorry. You know, with um, I don't know if I made a mistake. I I know you said you were at uh. I I think I may I may have um. Gotten confused on the the time no zone because it should have been noon your time. But somehow but that's, I have to, that's I okay made it to C plus the, one. I'm not quite sure why I did that. The good thing is that the the Zoom meeting was set up to start in an hour from now. Yeah. So and whoever the has tried uh, so whoever has tried will know that it starts in an hour from now. Yeah, and the website also has it correct. Okay. So anybody that saw your page, um, yeah, it should be okay. But I guess it's just if you had uh, articulated to anybody. Yeah, the web page, I don't know uh, because, okay, let me see, just to be sure. No, I just tested it. And so it says Central European time. I think I somehow, I don't know why I got that messed up. Okay, so Central European, so because I'm in Central European time. Okay. UTC plus one is Central European time, I think. And London is UTC. So London is not Central European time. Oh, uh, so did I, can? so CET and UTC plus one are different? Uh, I think they are the same. Uh, they, they, I think they are uh, the same. Yes, they are the same. But I'm in Central European time. 
Spain okay, but if you go to like the see the time zone calendar, yeah. So if you click on that, um, find your local time. Mm -hmm. Let me see. So now I am in UTC plus one. So last year I used this time zone converter. So are you on that page? Yes, I am. And um, here I'm going to share my screen so you can see. But yes. um, so this is what I was basing the uh, the plan for off of, and it. Let me quickly. I'm in Eastern Daylight Time. Yes. But so it. So are you saying, but so I'm confused if, if this is saying Central European time is 12 noon, but you're saying yes. it's one. No, no, it's, it's, it's correct. So I'm in Central European time, which is the same as UTC plus one. Okay. So the webpage says that it starts basically now. Uh, well, hmm. Because right now it's six ten a.m. my time, not seven. Oh wow, <laughs> that's weird. So are we in one of the uh, daylight savings time kind of issues going on here? Oh, me okay, that's a good question. Because you know this this um is using. I don't, I'm trusting this website, but last year when I did 24 of them straight, it worked perfectly. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I would. N I mean, I don't think that. Uh, no, the hour hasn't changed for the last week, and won't change today. It's. Uh, I would have known at least here. Yeah. So this is so, odd. Yeah. So this this so so the the website is telling us 12 noon, which you just hit. Yeah. But yet, it's telling my time is wrong. Yeah. Because it should have said 6 o'clock a.m. then. Yeah, that's weird. Wow. Anyways, um, again, the good point is that as you get into the, well, first of all, the, the Zoom meeting is already open. So whoever steps yeah. in. Uh, and then... Um, yeah. It's Sorry to interrupt. It's interesting that Inza isn't here then. That's a good point too. Hmm. Well, let's proceed. We know at least we're going to have one attendee. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, do you want to do you want to try um, displaying mm -hmm. your desktop? Yes. Um. And Sergio, thanks again for doing this. Oh no, it's been a um, it's an it's been a uh, a nice process. Um, okay, you are gonna have to remind me how to share my screen because I'm going to the more option and I don't see. Um, oh, share screen. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, you know what? It's recording right now, so I'm gonna actually turn it off. <laughs> All right. Um, so welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons Second World Commons Week event. Uh, this is the regional keynote webinar for Europe. Uh, and this is the, the first event of the week, so I'm, I'm very excited. My name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm also a member of the International Association for the Study of the Commons Executive Council. And, an or and the organizer of the World Commons Week event. Um, I, I really appreciate all the attendees and who are on the line. Um, uh, as, as you all may know, World Commons Week is a global annual event celebrating promoting both commons research and practice. And it has two primary components. One is uh, coordinated local events around the world. And this year, a set of regional or continental keynote webinars. Uh, this latter uh, component is one of IASC's efforts to promote global dialogue on commons research and practice by taking advantage of internet technology 
allowing our community to get to gather virtually while reducing our community's carbon footprint and its impact on the global atmospheric commons. So uh, again, I'm really thrilled you're all attending. Let me explain how this webinar is going to work. Um, we've asked our distinguished speaker to talk more than 35 minutes. I'll act as the timer and I'll, I'll provide a verbal reminder um, when Sergio has five minutes left. Uh, the last 15 minutes will be left for question and answers. Attendees, to ask a question, um, if you move your mouse to the bottom of the Zoom window, if you've never used Zoom before, there's a Q&A function, um, a question and answer function that you can get access to if you're using your computer. So you can type in your questions and then uh, Enza, who's on, the, I'll, I'll introduce in a minute, um, and I will moderate those questions for Sergio. If you're calling in using a phone, although I think everyone on the attendees is using a computer, but if you're calling in on a phone to ask a question, you dial star nine to toggle or raise or lower your, the lower your hand function on Zoom. And we'll see that hand raised and we can unmute your phone so you can ask your question. So at this point, let me turn it, the microphone over to the IASC Regional Coordinator for Europe, Professor Inza Thielsfeld who will introduce our speaker and act as the moderator during the question and answer session. So, Inza? Yeah, welcome everybody. It's my real pleasure to run together with you and Sergio and Charlie and all our listeners this webinar. Um, as leading Europe for a while now within our organization and also pushing together with Charlie to have this second round of um, ISC Global Week of the Commons. I'm happy to meet within the start of the whole week with a European talk. And let me introduce Sergio, our distinctive speaker for today. Um, I met him quite a while ago. I think in Bloomington we met the first time when we both were very interested in working on water governance. And since then, as far as I saw it, over and over again, he made the journey from Spanish irrigation, water governance, climate change within experiments, frameworks, IID framework. He will talk about that today and polycentricity, if just to mention a few keywords. He is currently holding a Marie Curie as a Marie Curie scholar based in Barcelona at the moment, but also still affiliated to the Ostrom workshop in Indiana and at the WINS, the workshop on institutional analysis in Berlin, where he was uh, for a while at Humboldt University. Um, he also functions as an executive editor for our journal, the International Journal of the Commons, where we are always keen on receiving good and nice papers. And therefore, as he spent all these efforts and interesting topics with, for our um, ISC group and scholarly attention, I'm happy to listen to your talk now, Sergio, and later I'm looking forward to our debate. Thank you very much, uh, Insa, uh, for the nice introduction, also for leading the European chapter of the ISC. And also thank you to Charlie Schweig uh, for the wonderful uh, leadership of the World Commons uh, Week second edition. Um, so the title of my presentation could be also um, Title like this, a brief overview and two messages about the institutional analysis and development framework. Because indeed what I want to do is convey basically two messages while I do a little historical parkour of the IAD. And um, the first message is that the IAD framework is indeed a, it's a family of tools, of analytical tools that um, that we can use basically on a demand basis, uh, depending on our research question and goals. The second message is that uh, each of these tools are incomplete. And they are incomplete because, as probably you all know, uh, science is a crafting process. 
Um, and so the tools uh, have to be refined as we use them and test them. But also because many of these tools are uh, historically uh, contingent, right? So they are developed to address certain questions uh, on problems uh, that may not be the same than the questions and problems that we will face in the future. Um, so with these two key messages, I would like to start off first with this historical parkour of the ID family of tools. I will pay a quick uh, attention to yeah, three of those tools that I believe have gained quite some momentum recently, the institutional grammar tool, the networks of action situations, and the SES framework. And then I will um, move on to, well, identify some of the pending puzzles um, that revolve around these uh, tools and some of the sort of responses emerging from the scholarship. And I will finalize with some ideas to move forward. So first message, a family of IA tools. I would like to start in 1982 um, with this graph that I, I assume is quite familiar to many of you. And this is the box and arrows diagram. We could call it like that. And it represents this, uh, it's the most popular uh, visualization of the ID. And it basically invites the researcher to conceive um, social phenomena or outcomes as the result or the aggregation of um, decisions made by independent uh, actors um, as they are shaped by contexts with particular biophysical, social, and institutional conditions. So, um, as I said, this is the most popular visualization of the IAD. Um, however, we didn't know the IAD as such um, right away. Um, before that, um, there was a paper published in 1982 uh, by Larry Kisser and Eleanor Ostrom that sort of introduced three uh, fundamental concepts uh, or actually tools of the IED that you cannot see here. The first of them is the, um, the action situation, uh, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with. The action situation is a key concept in the IED. It precisely refers to that space of interdependent actors um, and it was a groundbreaking uh, point at that time. Uh, at that time, many political scientists were trying to understand better how to relate institutions and behavior, and, uh, but this relationship wasn't really formalized. So the IED was, in a way, an attempt to formalize that relationship. And the groundbreaking aspect of the action situation is that uh, as Elinor Ostrom explicitly said in her presidential address to the Public Trade Association in 86, that institutions do not affect behavior directly but indirectly through by structuring these spaces of interdependence. And they, they do so in different ways. Um, and that's the sort of the second element that I wanted to talk about. Uh, uh, and those ways are the different types of rules. So Eleanor Ostrom and Larry Kisser um, envisioned seven universal rules that structure action situations, including informational rules, aggregation rules, boundary rules, position rules, and so on and so forth. So this also conveyed an important idea, which is the understanding of institutions as configurations. Uh, of institutions um, and the need to precisely approach the relationship between institutions and behavior by looking at those configurations. And so the third element in that initial proposal in 82 was another way to structure institutions here vertically by consuming uh, three levels of action, the operational level, the, constitution, the collective choice level and the constitutional level. One could even add a, a fourth level, the meta-constitutional level. Um, so operational level is where rules affect uh, the daily behaviors of individuals when they drive through highways uh, in the right, in Central Europe, for example, or when they are using uh, water from a river. 
collective choice level is where the rules that affect how the operational rules are designed um, uh, play a role. And the constitutional level basically tells us who is entitled to uh, design those rules. And, but I wanted, I didn't want to go beyond 1982 before talking about another tool or element of the ID that doesn't tend to be associated to the ID, but I think it's very important, which is the typology of goods. This was uh, put forward by Vincent and Elinor Ostrom in 1977. It is very difficult to think about interdependence of actors if we don't realize that uh, many of the goods and services that these actors are making decisions about are common, whether public or common pool resources. I won't spend much time on this, but um, it's very important that typology to understand the reasoning behind uh, the interdependence and the action situation. Then we move to 1982, uh, where we see an important contribution by Della Schlager, uh, student of Elinor Ostrom, and Elinor Ostrom herself, uh, where they make a further step in formalizing the study of institutions, in this case, property rights. And this contribution is very much connected to the idea of action situations and uh, the configurations of rules that structure those action situations and shape the choices that uh, the individuals have in those situations. So indeed, you can see here on the columns in, of this table, different types of individuals as they have access to different um, sort of choices or um, or rights of access, withdrawal, management, exclusion, or alienation of different goods. So that was another important contribution. Um, let me move on to the next slide. Let's see if, okay. In 1995, we have another tool emerging. Again, another formalization of the study of institutions. Um, uh, here it's important to recall that in this tradition, uh, the role of language um, was uh, very important uh, because institutions are conveyed uh, through language. So it was important for Crawford and Ostrom in this paper in 1995 to make a step forward and, and think of institutions are statements that could be dissected as if we were basically doing language analysis. Um, so I will make a quick stop here to um, illustrate a couple of illustrations of the institutional grammar tool. Um, so through this graph, which comes from a, a recent paper by Siddiqui et al, 2019, you can see the basic logic behind the institutional grammar tool, which can be used to sort of better understand both institutions in form and in use as institutional statements. And this grammar has, well, up to now six uh, potential components that allow us, uh, this is an important uh, application of the grammar, to distinguish three types of institutions, strategies, norms, and rules. So strategies would have certain components of the, of the grammar, like in this example you can see on the screen, while uh, norms will have some other components and uh, rules uh, will end up having all the components of, of the grammar. Um, so the grammar has been uh, used for different purposes. Some of the earlier applications of the grammar um, was not surprisingly in the modeling uh, um, context, but specifically in agent-based modeling context. Um, so agent-based models uh, try to understand outcomes, mostly social outcomes, as precisely the aggregation of um, the, the interdependent decisions of actors. So they simulate um, interactions among archetypical actors uh, to explore the emergent uh, patterns, right? So you can see how uh, important is to be very explicit in specifying which are the 
reasoning logic behind the decisions of each of those types of actors. And that's precisely where uh, the, the grammar has been used for. Um, so um, if we think of an actor that has an action under certain conditions and then there are payoffs, then you can use the adico or the six um, elements of the grammar to be sure that uh, you go through each of those elements uh, in specifying those um, those aspects. So the A of the adico, which is the attribute, would, would tell us which type of actor we are talking about. The the aim, which be the which be the will be the action. The C would be the conditions, and so on and so forth. So Smackle and et al. was, I believe, the first paper that used the grammar to do modeling, but there have been others more recently. Another interesting application um, and has been more frequent is to study, to do case studies of, um, to, to understand policies and regulations within a sector or across sectors. Here we have, uh, I believe, one of the last examples of that approach by Tanya Haikila and Chris Weibel. They, here they basically study eight different regulations of gas and, and shale gas, uh, sorry, shale oil and gas. Um, and they use the grammar to identify relationships between actors. So uh, as I said before, the grammar allows us to identify which actor has to do what with regard to what. And, um, and so by, by, by using that logic, we can identify relationships between actors uh, um, and, yeah, and objects. And we can also think of objects as another actor. So what they do is identify dyads of actors as prescribed in institutional statements across these 11 regulations. So what you can see in these two graphs is, um, well, the result of that exercise for two of the 11 regulations. You can see in the x-axis all the actors that they've identified. Um, and in the y-axis, you can see the number of institutional statements that put each of those actors in relationship with another actor. And then the color codes of the bars reflect, reflect the types of relationships between those dyads of actors, whether those are about authority distribution, collective choice, information sharing, enforcement, and so on. So this allows them to explore in a way or better characterize multi-level governance um, by looking at the diversity of actors involved um, in each of the regulations, the number of them, but also the different types of relationships that uh, relate uh, to each other. So another, I, I think, nice in, uh, implementation or application of the IGR. Okay, we continue with the historical parkour. Uh, the next stop is 2007, um, where Elinor Ostrom uh, launched the SES framework. Um, this, uh, I believe, represents an important inflection point in the family of uh, IAD tools, because contrary to previous contributions, the IAD doesn't try to formalize institutions, but actually make the idea a bit more complex um, and address some criticisms that had emerged until then, mostly related to the difficulties to develop theory beyond the identification of variables um, that would um, explain uh, mostly sustainable natural resource management. So you can see here the IDF framework. Um, one of the ultimate goals of the framework was also to uh, facilitate comparisons across uh, case studies. And that's what we see here in one of the earliest applications of the SES framework, uh, carried by Javier Basurto, who was a student of Edela Schlager, and Elinor Ostrom in 2009. Here they use the SES framework to profile um, three uh, local uh, uh, fishing um, uh, management systems in Mexico to explain um, um, the extent to which uh, some of them have been able to self-organize and manage sustainably their resources, and some others ha have not. So by Structuring the data through the SES framework, they are able to basically do some counterfactual analysis and, for example, infer that, well, maybe uh, trust reciprocity 
which is lacking in the sort of <clears throat> unsuccessful case, has to do something uh, um, with, with that outcome given that the other two cases um, that are successful have high levels of trust and reciprocity, and so on and so forth. Another interesting application of the SES framework is to use it for diagnosis purposes. And here I, uh, I want to bring you a very elegant example of this, uh, authored by Dan Cole, Mike McGuinness, and Graham Epstein in 2014. Here they use the SES framework to um, question the tragedy of the commons, but not only the tragedy of the commons as we know it by Harding, but also the interpretation of Eleanor Ostrom herself. Um, so what you can see here is basically a depiction of the tragedy of the commons uh, understood through the lenses of the SES framework. Uh, you have here the different components with some of the variables that are uh, relevant for for the case uh, or for the tragedy context. So we have a pasture um, that is finite, uh, is renewable, but it renews slowly. We have a large number of users who benefit from putting cattle in the pasture in the short term, and this is because the cattle gives them a value. Um, and well following the logic of Harding in a context where we don't have um, a property rights or any governance system whatsoever, uh, we see that the outcome is the destruction of the pasture. What Eleanor Ostrom and colleagues uh, contributing to uh, the scholarship on community-based natural resource management said is, okay, well, maybe, and um, the tragedy is not such a tragedy and just a problem that can be solved by, among other things, uh, creating common property regimes. And, and, and that's what they did. Um, but uh, uh, Cole et al. say, well, maybe both Harlin and Eleanor Ostrom did not study in depth the full complexity of the situation, in part because because they, for example, didn't take into account that, well, farmers are interested in putting cattle in the pasture because they are enjoying, enjoying um, private property rights, secure private property rights over the cattle that allows them to appropriate uh, that um, uh, value stream. Um, also, um, um, they enjoy that because there's a market for the for the meat and for the milk and so on uh, and yeah they they keep on using the framework to um, illustrate for example that well if the grass is uh, fast growing instead of slow growing maybe the tragedy uh, won't emerge as quickly um, or, uh, well, if the farmers do not have an easy access to cattle, um, then uh, maybe the tragedy won't emerge anyways. So this is an example of using the SH framework for diagnosis. And the final step in our parkour is 2011, when Mike McGuinness uh, launched uh, the idea of uh, networks of action situations by building on the idea of adjacent action situations with the again, uh, intention to make the idea a bit more amenable to study the complexity of uh, mostly natural resource management and the provision of uh, um, local services. Um, so here, very quickly, um, I want to show you one of the illustrations that Mike McGuinness uses in his paper uh, based on uh, main fisheries. So he conceived um, the management of main fisheries through four action situations. The main action situation or the focal action situation includes actually multiple tasks, including, well, the harvesting of the, fisher, uh, of the fishes, uh, but also the stocking or the provision of fishes and the monitoring of the rules uh, that serve to, to manage the, the resource. That situation is featured by fishers and harbor uh, gangs mostly. And the situation is affected by decisions made in adjacent action situations. On the right hand side, we have the, the situation that sort of represents the market of fishes 
and includes the consumers, merchants, and the fishermen also. On the left-hand side, we have the situation that um, sort of produces higher level rules and the coordination between fishers and other actors, including the state legislatures and the state regulators. Uh, regulators. The fourth actual situation is that it helps to solve dispute uh, um, conflicts. We could call it uh, the tribunals or the courts. Um, and it's, uh, well, as Mike McGinnis says, uh, would help in this case to solve conflicts that have not been able, uh, that the fishers themselves have not been able to solve within their own uh, local context. Another illustration um, uh, comes from a paper that I wrote with some other colleagues in 2015. Um, um, we use here the networks of action situations to study the water energy nexus. We conceive, um, as you know, water energy nexus has been a scholarship, has been interested in identifying trade-offs and synergies between the use of energy, uh, water, and the production of food. And we propose to conceive each uh, sector as framed within one or multiple action uh, situations that, has, that are featured uh, by different sets of actors and governance systems. We also propose to sort of set the boundaries and organize these action situations uh, depending on whether energy is used to produce water and then in turn food or whether food is used to produce energy and then extract water, uh, or whether uh, yeah, water is used to produce energy, and so on and so forth. So here you can see an example of applying this framework to uh, a large irrigation uh, project in Spain, where farmers use electricity to pump water, and in turn they use that water to produce food. So that's what you can see in these three chain action situations, the distrib an electricity distribution situation, the water distribution situation, and the food production situation. And then you can see the different governance systems and actors that are involved uh, uh, or affect those situations. So you can see, for example, how uh, the farmers as uh, embedded in irrigation districts first need to self-organize to allocate the water and within each of the systems or districts that compose the large irrigation project, but they also have to organ self-organize to participate in collective bargaining with electricity cooperators um, to, well, set fair prices for the electricity they consume. Um, so this allows to understand a bit um, the ecology, if you want, of action situations that, uh, and, and potentially also identify uh, points of conflict in the use of water and energy and the production of food. Okay, uh, the second message that I wanted to touch on uh, today is that all these tools are incomplete. Uh, I think you've, been, you've seen a little bit of this uh, um, until now, and that's fine. Um, they are incomplete because, for example, the SES framework, scholars are still struggling to select the variables and how to study interactions among them. Um, scholars interested in the networks of action situations are still unsure how to draw the boundaries around each of the action situations. Those working with the action situation and the different rules that shape them uh, sometimes struggle, struggle to operationalize each of those seven rules that structure the situations. Um, yeah, the typology of good is... Uh, has been also questioned uh, because it doesn't really problematize around the role of technology, which uh, could change the nature of, of, of the goods. Um, and also those uh, using the grammar, uh, um, the institutional grammar tool are also struggling among other things with how to aggregate those tools. And again, the box and arrows diagram suffers also from some blind spots like the evaluative criteria. Not many people have really studied the evaluative criteria. And 
And as I said, that's fine because uh, no tool is the ultimate tool, um, nor an improved version of any of the other tools. They are complementary, but most importantly, uh, as I said at the beginning, each of these tools have to be crafted as they, as they are used to tackle different analytical puzzles and research questions, and also as they informed different audiences. So, um, I'm going to fly through some of the puzzles that are revolving uh, around the SES framework, the IJT, and the networks of action situations quickly. Um, so, as I started hinting at, uh, some of the puzzles of, uh, that scholars are struggling with when using the SES framework have to do with how to select variables and how to measure them. If we want to compare cases across, um, then we need to be sure that we uh, measure the variable similarly, and that's something that the SES framework hasn't really been very explicit about. Um, uh, we are st still struggling about how to add new variables to the initial list, um, and also how to study interactions. So one of the components of the SES framework is uh, precisely the interactions component, which, by the way, mirrors quite closely the idea of the action situation. But that doesn't necessarily have to do a lot with the understanding of variables interaction. So the fact that, um, for example, group size may have a different impact on uh, self-organization capacity, depending on levels of heterogeneity, for example. And finally, there are uh, uh, scholars pointing to the need to move beyond um, uh, collective action theory, which is upon which many of the variables included in the SES framework uh, have been identified. Um, so I want just quickly to touch on two, two examples of what I think are the sort of um, front end of um, uses of the SES framework. The first of them comes from Epstein et al, 2013, pretty popular paper by now, where they um, proposed to study the evolution of eutrophication in the Lake Washington as a function of several variables, including the SES framework. Uh, the point of departure is the, well, the effectiveness of a policy that was implemented in the 70s to basically um, abate uh, nutrient pollution in the lake. Uh, as they point out, this policy was very effective. Um, and as they illustrate, it was very effective thanks to a number of biophysical characteristics of the lake, including its temperature, its depth, and its outflow. Um, so they argue about the importance of these variables by building on ecological theory or, or what they call ecological rules that relate eutrophication and the proliferation of algae to the phosphorus cycle and the presence of um, nutrient inputs. And so I believe this is an important illustration of how we can use theory, but not only social, but also ecological theory to select variables uh, in the SS framework and also reason about how those variables uh, affect outcomes. Another example that I wanted to touch on or, or just mention is the use of socio-ecological systems models. Uh, here you have an, an example of a systems analysis model that uses the SES framework to map all the different variables that are involved here to understand um, the use of summering pastures by herders in, in the Alps. Um, so through the color code and the different boxes and arrows you can track again, some of those variables to the SES framework. And as the authors mentioned, the SES framework was very useful for them to uh, define the boundaries of the system and be clear about which variables they were using. And I, using SES models is a very interesting way to study interactions, which as I said before, uh, is one of the aspects that the SES framework needs to be developed uh, a bit more. Um, here you have another example. This comes from a, a recent paper we are writing um, to use case study data to study precisely interactions. So what we've done is collect all the SES framework applications 
uh, that are based on case study methods and do a meta-analysis of them and explore uh, the extent to which uh, these uh, publications tells us, tell us uh, anything about how variables interact to explain outcomes. And through a different techniques, and here you have an example of one of them, the formal concept analysis, we are starting to unveil some of those interactions. In, in this example, you can see uh, how different um, a governance system, resource system, and interaction variables uh, interact to explain livelihood changes. Networks of action situations, some of the pending puzzles have to do with the identification of the boundaries or the action situations. Um, the types of games that are involved in those situations. Something that I haven't mentioned is that the idea of action situation builds to a great extent on game theory, uh, which tells us how to formalize and envision those interdependent uh, and strategic uh, decisions by, by actors. So we need to, to better understand uh, how different types of games play out in these action uh, networks of action situations. Another pending puzzle has to do with um, the types of linkages. Um, um, and I'm going to be closing uh, now. Um, and a final, a final pending aspect has to do with the analysis. So um, there are examples of people using the networks of action situations, but um, we haven't gotten quite there yet in terms of using that grid to, um, to do analysis. So here I want to show some uh, some examples of uh, some of us who are trying to, to move in that direction. Here you have a description of um, water and energy use in uh, Indian irrigation systems in Hyderabad. This comes from a paper authored by Christian Kimmich and myself in 2017. Each of the boxes represent action situations as they, um, they affect the use of energy and, and water. I won't, spend, uh, um, I won't spend a lot of time here because I will do it in the next example, which comes from the same paper. And this, uh, again, applies the networks of action situations to, to a case uh, of irrigation and, and energy uh, management in Spain. It's the same case that I profiled previously. So here you can see uh, how water allocation um, is partially depending on water appropriation, um, but also on infrastructure maintenance and monitoring and the allocation of energy, which also depends on the investments in, um, in the electricity grid and in, in the water allocation. Each of the signs here um, in the arrows indicate three types of linkages, uh, institutional, informational, um, yeah, it's mostly two, institutional and informational, or oh, and biophysical, sorry. And then you can see in the dashed uh, boxes the different actors that are involved. I won't spend much time here. Uh, I will just say that once we have this configuration of action situations, we can start doing some hypothetical analysis of how different decisions in one action situation would affect the focal action situation, which in this case is the water allocation situation. Um, um, uh, well, this is what I had planned to do, but I'm running out of time uh, now. And we can envision basically um, what we call a configurational analysis of policy options, depending on uh, which action situation they target and uh, how they affect outcomes in the focal action situation. And um, yeah, finally, I wanted to quickly go through some of the pending puzzles uh, um, uh, raised by uh, scholars using the institutional grammar tool. Um, most of the applications have been um, carried to study formal rules and not rules in use. So that's the uh, next step that needs to be covered. 
uh, scholars have raised also concerns about how to aggregate the rules once we've identified all the institutional statements, how to connect it to the levels of action, the operational, collective chase, and constitutional, um, whether we can use institutions as a dependent variable and not as independent variable, that's another, I would say, analytical challenge for the IGT. And also, um, there are issues related to uh, the fact that we're coding uh, regulations and policies through the grammar is quite labor intensive. So, um, here you have an example of a scholar, Thomas Olivier, who tried to use the, the grammar to move beyond the study of dyad relationships among actors, as I illustrated in the paper by Haikila and, and Weibel. Um, so they portray here the networks of actions that emerge out of the applying the, the grammar to the study of water management regulations in Boston and uh, New York. The interesting part is that they develop a series of uh, social network analysis metrics to identify differences in the network structures across the two sites. As you can see here, there are more reciprocal and transitivity uh, relations in New York, which in a way is telling us that the network in New York is a bit more redundant and dense. And as the Olivier argues, this has to do with the nature of the collective action problem actors are facing. As he illustrates, actors in the New York case are facing a rather a collective action conflictual situation that requires rules that bond uh, the actors with each other. While in Boston, the actors are facing a rather coordination situation that doesn't require such uh, bonding. Um, just for you to have a quick look um, to this, uh, another interesting contribution from Carter et al, 2015, that illustrates different ways to aggregate rules, which is, again, one of the other, uh, many other, or some of the other pending puzzles with the IGR. And here you can see they, they are studying uh, regulations for organic production. They identify what they call four macro situations. Here you have one, two, three, and four. So you have the state organic programs that um, once they are designed, they specify how certifiers and operators or farmers uh, can get their certifications and need to operate. And we also have, uh, well, the National Board of uh, Standards um, um, that's also the, the standards regarding the substances that organic farmers can and cannot use. So what you can see here in each of these uh, boxes and circles are what the authors call the meso action situations and the outputs that emerge out of the, each um, meso action situation. So the, one of those situations is the certifier accreditation, which can result in the accreditation denied, in which uh, case the certified engage in an appeal situation, or it can result in an accreditation granted, uh, in which case the, um, um, then the certified engage with the operator to grant the certification. The numbers within each, each boxes represent the number of institutional statements that shape that situation. And here you have another way to sort of aggregate the rules according to the levels of action distinction. Um, I won't spend much time here. Um, you can have a look at uh, the, the paper. So just to finish, um, and moving forward, um, as you can see, many of the analytic uh, improvements uh, uh, of the tools ha uh, have to do with the operationalization of the tools. The tools as they were designed initially lacked in, in, in many cases, uh, well, empirical testing. And so as we test them empirically, we can innovate and improve them. Um, we can also see that different people use different uh, tools together as they need so. And I think that's another way to innovate and, uh, and use the IED family of tools 
in a useful way. We can also use the tools to address new problem sheds like the water energy nexus, um, as I've illustrated, or shale gas extraction also, but also paving for ecosystem services or marine protected areas as it's been the case. Um, uh, we can also address uh, um, new questions like institutional change or, or connect with um, connected paradigms like uh, the power paradigm. I haven't talked much about this, uh, but that would be another way to sort of keep testing the, the tools and innovating. And finally, I wanted to, to raise the issue that I've, the ID framework is a conceptual framework, but uh, it's important to have in mind that the conceptual frameworks, uh, particularly now nowadays when we have access to so much data, are not that useful if we don't have data management frameworks or platforms to, uh, to, to store the data and, and query it in, uh, in useful ways. And so here you have a, a list of some of those, uh, uh, some, some attempts to start developing those uh, management frameworks. And, and with that, I would like to thank you all um, and looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, Sergio, very much for this very nice overview. I particularly appreciate this, first of all, historical journey or parkour, as you called it, uh, so that we have a better understanding where these two frameworks are coming from. And also these nice links to these various applications and papers so that we can also look it up later and uh, who applies which items out of the frameworks. Um, I would like to open up with if the audience, the participants have questions, feel free to type them in the um, question and answer sections and then I can have a look and pick them. Um, for the time when the participants might still think what to ask, I would like to pose a question because we had on Monday a little meeting in Berlin, a workshop organized by the International Association for the Study of the Commons, exactly on this SAS framework. And we discussed very heavily what if its role is to explain something or if it rather structures something. And then we need theory to explain what we see. And I see here in the uh, audience, there are also some people from this workshop. So Sergio, what is your opinion on that? Can we explain something directly with the framework or what's the role of theory in it then? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so um, frameworks, as far as I understand, following the, the ID tradition, do not necessarily explain th um, things or they do only at a very general uh, level. Theories are uh, the artifacts that we use to associate uh, variables with outcomes and that's what explains things. So the framework can host a number of, the SES framework can host a number of theories uh, that explain things. Now, um, it's a good question because as of now, the framework is pretty much prone to use theories that build on uh, collective action uh, theory, broadly understood. Uh, most of the variables make sense if we understand socioecological outcomes in the context of the, well, why not say in tragedy of the commons where resource users face social dilemmas to manage sustainably their resources. But uh, so then the challenge is how to use the framework to start using theories that are not necessarily building or based on this uh, analytical lens of uh, collective action problems. And one way to move forward that Stefan Partlow in a, in a nice paper in 2018 has put forward is precisely studying interactions. Uh, social and ecological interactions. And of course, adding new variables that are not necessarily uh, related to collective action theory. So that would be my answer to, to that question. Okay. <laughs> so attendees, you can raise either your hand. If you scroll down at the bottom of the screen, there should be an icon or you type a question in so that we can pick it up. 
So here is one, how to consider time aspect or trend of variables within the analysis, Sergio. Sorry, can you repeat, please? Yeah, I repeat. What about the time aspect or a trend of variables? How can you introduce that into using the SAS framework, for instance? Yeah, another good question. Um, well, first of all, I would like to say that understanding, we, we don't need to stick to the actual family of tools to understand um, uh, change. We can also come up with new tools that build on uh, the general understanding of action situations. This is to say that we shouldn't feel constrained by what we have in our hands. We can also innovate. Um, and we can innovate by using different sets of those tools. So there are people now who are using the SES framework um, to develop multiple snapshots of a case and see how the different variables are changing over time and they may be affecting outcomes. And so that will be one, one way. Another interesting way is precisely using um, models, um, systems models that um, basically simulate over time uh, the evolution of a, of a system as we um, tweak different parameters of it. So we can explore, we can do some sort of policy experimentation, for example, by tweaking institutional aspects of a particular description of an, of an SES and, and modeling. Um, so that would be two, two ways of introducing the time, time aspect, aspect. A different dimension of it is um, whether we want to explain institutional change, which um, has a very crucial time component and uh, I believe that we don't have quite yet a good uh, approach to it. There have been some um, proposals. So there's a paper by Basurto and Elinor Ostrom, I think it's in 2009, if I'm not wrong, where they proposed to use the, the seven root typology or the idea of action situation um, to understand how institutions evolve from strategies to norms and rules depending on changing conditions. Okay, Sergio, I have several questions here. Maybe just because you're picking on this rule paper, here's a question coming in which is very concrete. Could you give us an example of how property rights affect aggregation rules or boundary rules? So maybe yeah. from one of your Spain case studies, could yeah. you give an example? So I would, I, I would say that it goes the other way around. So uh, appropriation, okay, um, I'm not sure if I understand correctly the question, but so there are two ways of answering this. If the question means uh, how property rights affect access and withdrawal uh, of a resource, I would say that uh, that precisely speaks about where uh, the type of uh, claimant uh, you are. Um, so if we go back to the to the typology of, of property rights, we can, um, for example, in the context of an irrigation system, we can envision farmers that. Uh, uh, or, or farmers that have access to, um, to a particular irrigation system, but they don't need to use the water, they, they just need to, to, to use the, the paths of the system because they are not irrigators. In that case, they would be uh, just um, um, having uh, that right. And that there may be also uh, irrigators who also need the water and the rules grant them uh, the right to withdraw the water. Um, we could also add the right of managing the water if the irrigators, for example, have part, are part of uh, the irrigation association that is entitled with uh, developing the, um, the rules. Uh, so that's one answer. The other answer would be that, in fact, the property rights uh, are the result of um, using the seven rule typology um, to some extent. So um, we can think uh, of access and withdrawal and mostly speaking about um, uh, rules that are um, basically the operational choice while the, the management 
and exclusion and alienation would be uh, talking about the collective choice uh, level. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. that would be my answer. There are two more questions I fear. I would like to encourage the participants, maybe if we may, Sergio, that they send you a mail because sure. they're rather bit complicated about one thing is about how rational choice theory understanding appears in the IID and SAS. So that will take us, I think, a moment too long to discuss this now. Also, I would be in favor of listening to that. And the other person would like to know how to set up a framework for governance and urban adaptation and mitigation. I guess that relates to climate change. Mm -hmm. All right, so maybe they can drop a mail to you and get a quick answer on that. Yeah, well, so very, uh, very quickly, the rational choice question, I think it's very important precisely to realize that the idea is pretty much grounded in a rational choice approach to, um, to, 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 to human uh, decision making, as the, the, the colleague points out. Uh, and uh, I don't have a clear question to um, to whether the the framework can uh, accommodate um, more interpretivist or social cons constructionism perspectives. Um, I mean, it can do it marginally to the extent that um, we introduce the idea that uh, well, uh, institutions are also perceived. Um, so there, there is the need that um, there's a common understanding around institutions. Uh, so it's not sufficient that they are informed or 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 even in use by some people. But uh, the, the, all the perceptions mediate uh, the processes of institutional designs and compliance. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a difficult question because. Uh, rational choice and social constructivism are, uh, are two different epistemologies to explain outcomes in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other question, how to develop a framework that explains the climate change adaptation in the urban context? Um, I actually don't know. What I can say is that I used the SES framework to, to understand uh, um, adaptation capacity. Um, uh, and I did so by building on collective action theory again. Um, I, I used uh, cooperation um, as a proxy for that adaptation capacity in the context of irrigation systems. So I was trying to understand the different conditions under which uh, farmers are more or less able to um, cooperate in the advent of droughts, given that droughts sort of are a disturbance to their ability to cooperate. Um, so in other words, which variables of the SS framework allows us to understand the robustness of cooperation in the advent of disturbances? Um, okay. Yeah. Sergio, thank you. I think we can easily talk another hour. <laughs> Thanks to yeah. all participants to listen to our uh, first, a global keynote in the frame of the World Commons Week, organized by the International Association for the Study of the Commons. Um, this will be recorded or has been recorded, and we will make it available on the website, as this was such a nice overview you gave us. Thank you, Sergio, once again. Uh, Thank you. Feel free to listen to the other Global keynotes. Next one will be tomorrow, sent from Africa by Ruth Meinsendick on securing the commons and tenure and governance, which is also a very broad and very interesting topic to most of us. Um, yeah, I just see the slides coming up here. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Yeah, there are also many local events during this week which we organize, so feel free to stay in touch with our association and to follow what we offer you. I hope it's useful for your research or your activism, whatever you do out there in the world. I hand over to Charlie for some final words. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Sergio. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, and yeah, as, as Inza uh, just mentioned, it w this will be uh, maintained.
probably both on the World Commons Week 2019 website on Sergio's talk page. And then also, um, I, I've got to check on this, but I'm hoping it'll also be archived on the IASC, uh, the main IASC webpage. Um, and Sergio mentioned to me, he's also going to get some references, uh, some of the citations of the papers that he had on his slides. We'll put that up with the video. Um, so go back to his web, webinar page in a few days, hopefully, and it'll be up there. Um, I, and so in closing, Sergio, if you could just scroll to the map with the uh, yep. local events. Uh, yeah. One more, two more, I think it was, yeah, after the talks. Yeah, so uh, we're still even getting, even though we've started the week, we're still getting uh, local events. Uh, we got two more today. So we're over 50, which is uh, 20 more than we had last year. So we're growing. And I don't think it's uh, too late or, or too early at this point for anyone attending to think about a possible local event next year for the, the third one that we will run uh, a year from now, hopefully. And then uh, just to close, on behalf of IAC and the World Commons Week organizers, we'd really like to thank all the attendees for the time and attention today. Sergio for the great presentation, Enza for her leadership with the IAC Europe um, uh, group. And um, in closing, well, we just, we wanna remind you again about the other upcoming events. Uh, and if you appreciate this global collective action, uh, and if you're not an IAC member, you can see on the page uh, the link to join. Um, we, we're, we're always looking to have more membership. And thank you so much for all the great questions. They were really fantastic questions. So yeah. thank you all. I think at this point, we will close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Great experience. Cheers. Bye-bye.